Great. Uh, they're they're that. equitable. That's good. Excellent. Uh, so first one, the way we usually open these things, uh, I'm from uh, the Electric Vehicle Council, where the industry peak body represent car makers, uh, electrical equipment manufacturers, energy networks, retailers, all sorts of folks who've got a commercial interest in the transition to EVs. Uh, probably most folks on this call are familiar with who we are. We do a state of EVs report each year. And the next one's coming out in a few weeks' time. Uh, the last one, we did a recap at the end of 2023 on EV uptake, and we're showing the standard hockey stick curve of EV uptake rising. Uh, year to date this year, it's not continuing to rise at 100% year on year. The growth rate has tapered off a little bit, but we've still got a growth rate. So for the first half of this year, we're a little shy of 10%, about one new vehicle in 10 being sold in Australia is an EV. Uh, this varies markedly across different LGAs. So if you look at some of the inner suburban areas, particularly the areas where people have got more money than average, where people who vote more teal than average, you'll see more EVs in those regions than in some other regions. Uh, so these numbers are certainly not uniform. Uh, in terms of data around that, we report on EV uptake at a postcode level. And in various jurisdictions, you can get EV uptake and registration data at either a postcode or an LGA level. A couple of quick bits about charging at home. Uh, picking up on some of the commentary from AEMO, we also recommend charging during the middle of the day if you can. It's the cheapest electricity available to the average driver. It's also the best from an emission standpoint. Uh, and it's the best for the energy system. For drivers for whom it's not practicable to charge during the middle of the day though, which is a lot of drivers, we recommend charging in the middle of the night. So best option is middle of day, second best is middle of the night, and please not at five or six in the afternoon when you're running your air conditioner and your induction cooktop and everything else in your house. Uh, we've got a guideline on our website that talks to consumers about that. I'll talk a little bit about cost of fuel before I move into housing and tenure type instruction. Where people are driving a petrol or a diesel car, you're looking at roughly two bucks a litre, roughly seven litres per 100 k's. So it's about $14 per 100 kilometres. If you're looking at a fast charger, so public DC charging or at-home charging at peak prices, you're looking in the seven to $12 per 100 kilometres range. And this is because the cost of the electricity per kilowatt hour is higher in those settings than it is in others. Off-peak electricity, so people charging in the middle of the night on an EV plan will be paying somewhere under 10 cents per kilowatt hour for their electricity, about two bucks per hundred case. If they're self-consuming their own solar at home, about five cents per kilowatt hour is the feed-in tariff that they're missing out on. In terms of the direction of travel on these things, it's likely that petrol prices will rise. It's likely that the cost of fast charging will rise. It's likely that the cost of peak time electricity will rise. None of these things on the left are likely to go down meaningfully because they cost money to deliver. Off-peak electricity is likely to get cheaper. Self-consumed solar is likely to get cheaper. So to the extent that people are getting into EVs and they're able to charge them at home and manage their charging times, they're likely to, to derive financial benefit. They're also likely to be able to uh, deliver those sorts of system benefits that the team from AEMO are talking about. In terms of where the charging happens, uh, this is my chart for the building type. So the columns are different types of housing that people have and the rows are whether they own or rent those homes. On the left-hand side, for people with standalone homes and off-street parking, which is 75% of the Australian population, very little help is needed for them. Uh, the existing power point on the wall gets used by the majority of EV drivers for their EV charging. This doesn't mean that they can't avoid peak time. It just means they set the charging time in their car rather than using a, a more complicated approach. If you're renting in that setting, a lot of ink has been spilled on the subject of solar and owners versus renters and split incentives and equity. In EVs, that problem is going to be less pronounced because a person who rents a home that's got standalone, uh, that is standalone or has off-street parking can plug into the PowerPoint. For someone who wants to install an EV charger there, installing an EV charger in a standalone home is a pretty straightforward thing to do. Strata is an area where local government have a role to play around things like development control plans, planning approvals, that sort of thing. A lot of work's been done in the NCC around setting up new rules for new build apartments to be EV ready. Uh, for retrofit of EV apartments, there's an awful lot of work to do. 
local government's role in there is largely going to be around planning approvals and making sure that the things that local government do don't inhibit the owners, corporations and the stratas and the businesses from doing that retrofit work in those buildings. And then on the right-hand side, houses without off-street parking. This is where, where we don't want to see an outcome of consumers pulling extension leads across footpaths. The outcome that we want is people charging an equipment that is designed and fit for purpose. Uh, for the person who owns their own home, who wants to charge in front of their house from their own asset, uh, some exploratory work was done by City of Port Phillip. They're looking to expand that, I think, around running private lines under council footpaths to do a pop-up thing at the street side. Very new, very, uh, I guess, innovative and a little different to how things are being done in other parts of the world and around the country. So there's trials underway, definitely plausible to do it that way. Uh, for the person who rents a house without off-street parking, they don't really have a pathway to deploying their own charging infrastructure at their home. So those folks, as I mentioned, largely dependent on public charging infrastructure. A couple of quick images around the sorts of infrastructure that we're talking about here in the public domain. On the left-hand side, pole-mounted charges. Uh, pole-mounted charges are going to be a collaboration between the charge point operator, that's the person who owns and operates the equipment, the DNSP, that's the network operator, your City Power, PowerCore, United, uh, Osnet, uh, and, uh, sorry, I'm forgetting one, uh, Gemini, the five DNSPs in Victoria. In Victoria, this will be a collab between CPOs, the DNSPs, local government, absolutely crucial because local government owns the parking space that sits in front of the pole, right? Local government, uh, the CPOs and the DNSPs will need to sit around a table to work out how this is going to roll out in a particular LGA and how it's going to work. Community engagement is going to be absolutely critical. Uh, so some of the, uh, the elements that might not be immediately apparent, if you deploy an EV charger in front of a home of someone who doesn't own an EV, then all of a sudden they may be less able to park in front of their house, which is a thing that they might value and might wish to be able to do. This sort of community engagement piece is where local government has a much, much better pathway towards getting it done well than other layers of government because you are in the local community. Recharging time at assets like this, you're talking something like four to eight hours to do a recharge of a car from an asset of that nature. So the, the use case, the ideal place for it is those resi streets without access to off-street parking. The use being the person either plugs in at the start of the day, charges during solar in the middle of the day, or they plug in in the afternoon when they get home from work and charging happens through the middle of the night when the network's not running at peak. Uh, on the right-hand side, fast charges. Uh, role for local government there, given that local government owns so much of the urban parking environment in those business districts where these things are a really good fit. Uh, zero or low cost leases for car parking spaces. I mentioned that because I think we had an earlier presentation that identified not much money is being made out of public EV charging. It's not a highly profitable activity. So to the extent that leases get applied to the CPOs who are deploying the equipment, those costs need to be passed on in the form of higher costs to drivers. And if what we're trying to do is accelerate the uptake of EVs, that's not necessarily a favourable thing to do. Uh, different regions will vary. So uh, per Vincent's comment a little earlier, there will be cases where in particularly attractive locations, there might be competition among CPOs for that location. And in that setting, if there's a lease that's non-zero cost, fair enough. What I'd highlight is that most CPOs will be going into these discussions looking for the discussion to start at zero cost with any non-zero requirement being, please justify this, noting that we'll have to pass those costs on. Uh, community engagement, at least as important as in pole-mounted charging because you're talking about car parking spaces that your local community use. I'll note that the use case for those charges is twofold. In the more urban environments, it's about providing charging equipment for people who can't charge their cars easily at home. In the more regional environments, this is about enabling the traveler who is moving through your jurisdiction to stop in your central business district while they're charging their cars and spend money with local business. So two perhaps slightly distinct classes of user, but good reason for local government to support both of them. Uh, and then recharging time there, 15 to 60 minutes. What you're talking about here is someone who is stopping for a coffee break or a lunch break, charging their car, getting whatever commercial task it is they are doing and done, and then moving on to make room for the next person. 
Some resources that I'll drop in the chat. Uh, EBC website has guidelines around development control plans for apartments. So if you're looking to go above and beyond the requirements of the National Construction Code, we've got published elements to make it easy for you to do that in a manner that is consistent with other jurisdictions around the country and that will be easy for builders and electricians to execute. Uh, we've compiled various installation rules from around the country, details around maximum demand for any techo folks on the call who want to understand how to work out the impact of these things. We've also got a consumer hub, which looks at life cycle emissions, cost calculators, the home charging guide I mentioned earlier. And coming very soon, we've got a retailer comparison tool, which is designed to help consumers find the best value EV plans that are available in a residential electricity setting. And we're also producing a template lease agreement and guidance materials specifically aimed at helping local governments and CPOs work together on exactly what a lease looks like. Uh, the motivation for doing that came out of New South Wales. Essentially, government there identified that one of the challenges was that with many LGAs and many CPOs all approaching this challenge with different perspectives and different viewpoints, uh, a common starting point of a guideline document and a lease agreement might be a useful thing to bring into existence. And so we've worked with them to create it. It should be launching in a couple of weeks. Uh, I'm going to drop a couple of notes in the chat for links to those things, but that was it for my presentation. Happy to go to Q&A. Great. Thanks, Ross. Lots of um, good updates for us to think about. And um, I'm, I'm particularly um, interested in the the guidelines for developers for multi-unit dwellings to kind of push that along a bit. So looking forward to seeing that. Um, you're still sharing your screen. We can see a little uh, Word document of notes. So um, no worries. Thank you. Sorry about that. That was uh, me preparing to drop the uh, drop the links in the chat immediately after I finish talking. There you go. That is perfectly fine. Now I am just doing a scan for any hands that are up. Can't see any, but oh, there might be something in the chat. No, that's you. Uh, any particular questions? Somebody is, uh, Paul, before he left, just pop, popped in the chat that this, the Port Phillip model is fraught with significant issues. Um, and he strongly recommends that this, this um, pro, you know, approach is, you approach that with caution. So I don't know whether you wanted to sort of say any more about um, that, Ross? Yeah, oh, look, what I would observe there is that it's one where the homeowner is carrying the cost of running equipment, uh, a private line under the footpath to the space in front of their house. Uh, at a technical level, it can work. It's safe. Uh, the biggest issue with it is the homeowner's belief state that that creates for them a right to park in front of their house, which is not necessarily something that they actually have. Uh, so if that model is being executed, making sure that there's clear communication about what this actually entitles the homeowner to is going to be important. Uh, and the other thing, as I said, when I the observation I made when I was presenting, it may work for the homeowner who's prepared to pay the several thousand dollars to upgrade their, their home in that setting. That approach is unlikely to solve for the renter, though, for the same reason that we see less solar panels on the roofs of rented properties than we do on owned properties. So in terms of actually meeting the needs of the EV driving populace, it's not going to be a substitute for public charging equipment in all cases, because it's not a solution that will work for everybody. Yeah, uh, I suppose yes. different suburbs are different too, right? So if I think about where I live in Mooney Ponds, neighbours don't typically park in front of each other's houses around my neighbourhood, it'd probably work. My sister-in-law lives in Fitzroy, it would not work quite so well in Fitzroy. So jurisdiction by jurisdiction, it will vary depending on the parking mix and the, uh, and the resident mix. Yes, and the, yes, the, the culture of parking, which absolutely, um, as a councillor, I know it definitely varies from suburb to suburb where I am too. Uh, look, if there are no more questions, but people do think of them later, we can you can always pop them in the chat or give them to Jane and we can um, pass them over to Ross. Oh, hold on. We've got one from, thanks, Michelle. You just snuck in. Um, in terms of zero cost leases, will this skew the market for CPOs in the same way that free AC recharging from councils is now seen as not such a great thing due to impacts on CPOs? Oh, right. Okay. So I'm... Not talking about free electricity being delivered to the drivers. I'm talking about 
the least cost for the person who is investing the tens of thousands of dollars in building the charging infrastructure. Uh, to be clear, uh, we would not suggest that running zero cost electricity to the consumers in the public environment is a great idea. The outcome of doing that is that consumers who could be charging at home and keeping their vehicle out of the way of the public domain are incentivized by that zero cost electricity to instead come into the public domain and charge their car there. The outcome of that is that the consumer who actually needs to access that equipment can't access it because it's being blocked by someone who's getting a cheaper deal. Uh, zero cost leasing to the charge point operator who is spending the money to deploy all the infrastructure is about ensuring that the cost of electricity to the drivers can be kept to a reasonable minimum. So instead of it being 70 or 80 cents a kilowatt hour, it might be 50 or 60 cents a kilowatt hour, for example. Uh, the ideal outcome is that public high power charging should cost more than charging at home in order to incentivize the right behaviors. Uh, does that address the question? Uh, thanks, Ross. Yes, I did. Um, I did understand that you were talking about free leases. I guess I'm just trying to um, fully understand the impacts of that on the market mm. and, and the benefits, given that for councils, there's a significant resource investment to uh, lease their land and there's an opportunity cost when when um, the car park space is, is turned over for EV recharging. So um, there's, there's good reason why we might want to charge a reasonable leasing fee, um, but you're saying the difference in the pass-on cost to drivers could be as much as... Uh, quite significant if it's a zero cost lease? I think what you would uh, what you would probably want to do there to work out the materiality of that cost. So any lease you apply inevitably will be passed on, right? That's the, the nature of business. It's yeah. ultimately the drivers that will pay for it. The way to work that through would be to talk to the CPO about the nature of the deployment that they are doing, how much electricity they are anticipating delivering, what they're anticipating charging for that electricity, and then spreading your lease cost across that amount. Uh, so you could do this as a back of the envelope, but it will vary significantly depending on what kind of infrastructure you're talking about. Uh, if you're talking about AC charges, their capacity to deliver energy is significantly less than DC charges. Uh, so yeah, different sites will deliver different amounts of energy. Different sites will also have completely different capital cost structures. Putting a couple of AC charges in a car parking space doesn't actually cost all that much. Putting in something like a multi-bay Tesla supercharging site is an exercise that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars and delivers energy commensurate with the kind of cost being, uh, being carried. Uh, if you like, we can follow up afterwards with some exemplar work. I think it's just the, the fundamental piece is that whatever dollar value you apply in the lease gets carried through as cost to the drivers. Um, yeah. Thank you. Great. Thanks for that um, question, Michelle, and the response. It doesn't look like there are any other questions for Ross. Um, so thanks, Ross, for joining us today and sharing that. That's really great. Um, no and thanks for you. Ross has popped his email um, address in the chat, so you can contact him directly if you've got any questions that you think about after the um, after the session. So we're going to um, wrap up for today, um, and thank you again to all our presenters um, for sharing your expertise. Thanks for all your questions and comments, and your interest, of course, in um, four wheel EVs. Um, what we're going to do is we have two videos that we also have to share with everybody. Um, one from Renko van der Pan, who's the project leader at sustainable mobility in Utrecht in the Netherlands, who has shared his insights into the rapidly expanding provision of charging in his hometown. And we have also a, a very local homegrown um, short video from Wyndham City Council's Ben Sinnott about EV user basics. And it has been described as top gear, but without the rev head attitude. So I'm looking forward to um, watching both of those. Um, Paul Swift from um, Marybeck also said uh, he's happy to sort of chat to anybody um, if they've got direct questions for him. 
And he also mentioned that there's an EV working group which people are encouraged to join. And um, if someone can drop the details of that in the chat, that would be great for those of us who um, are not part of that group. Um, and the last thing, we we will we are planning a two-wheeled EV forum um, either for September, hopefully before caretaker period kicks in. If we can't manage that, then um, it'll be early in the new year. Um, so thank you, everybody, for your attendance and your interest and for presenting, um, for asking those great questions and for continuing to work in this space. Have a lovely day. Thank you.